Senior geochemist Sam Pano has been conducting research at the Geological Survey for 27 years with a focus on karst geology and hydrology, groundwater chemistry, and earthquakes of the Midwestern U.S. In addition to the groundbreaking, or should I say broken ground work, sorry, <laughs> that Sam will be sharing with us tonight, he has played an immeasurably valuable role educating all of us about the geology of our area, speaking to the board of the League of Women Voters, advising the foundation on the geological aspects of Horseshoe Mound, giving talks like the land and water beneath us, leading the geological survey field trip through the county last year. How many did that? It was a great, great time. Um, not to mention his sense of humor and great patience answering endless, endless questions. Very much appreciated. Tell you what I'm gonna do is uh, talk a little bit about um, the geology or the significance of these lines that we were seeing and um, how they relate to the geology and the hydrogeology of the, uh, of the county. So, let's see, next, next, this, is, this is another view of some of the lines. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, one of the questions I kept getting is, is why do they call it the, the driftless area and why is the driftless area driftless? Well, they're talking about glacial drift um, clay, rich material, uh, silt that was brought in by glaciers. And um, they came in into two areas. There were, there were huge centers uh, between 2,600,000 years ago and 12,000 years ago. So there was, there was a, a center here, uh, centered by which, you know, there was a lot of snowfall and, um, and ice build up and glaciers developed and they started migrating down to um, Illinois. Then another center, the Dot Labrador Center, migrating in this direction. And um, reasons uh, that I won't go into right now, they, they uh, sideswiped uh, the driftless area. They, they, uh, these two didn't go into the area. Now, this is a map that Pius Weibel and I put together in the mid-1990s of the karst areas of the state, and uh, including Joe Davis County. And we've done research in, in most of these areas. And this is a map by the U.S. Geological Survey of the Karst Areas of uh, the United States. And again, um, you, see, uh, you see this area covered next. So what is Karst? Um, so since we're going to talk about it, and it's going to be every tenth word, so I might as well define it. Um, it's um, geologically and hydrogeologically integrated and interconnected. Self-organizing network of landforms and subsurface large scale, secondary porosity, and I don't know if you understand half of these words, but basically what it is is um, fractured rock, fractured, fractured bedrock made of carbonate rock, which is limestone and dolomite. Uh, here there's dolomite, uh, some limestone, and the rock gets fractured, and rainwater and snow melt seep into these fractures and enlarge them. And um, so there was, there was a scientist uh, that, uh, a very famous scientist, Jim Quinlan, who did uh, a lot of studies on karst, and he, he say, stated at one point that if you have carbonate rock, limestone or dolomite, you're gonna have karst unless something really unusual happened. So that's basically what this says. Uh, next slide, please. And then, um, so looking at the, the general geology of your area, uh, the geology is, is what we call layer cake geology, which is really nice because if you go in some areas, you know, the rocks are folded and they're standing on end, and it makes it very difficult to, to study. Um, in this area, everything's pretty much flat lying. So you have um, Galena Dolomite, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, making up a lot of the land surface being farmed. And, Makoka to shale, which is mostly shale, uh, sitting on top of that forming slopes, and then Silurian dolomite on top of that, which um, forms the, the cliffs. Next slide, please. So this is, this is what a geology map looks like of, of uh, Joe Davis County. The, the dark purple um, is Silurian dolomite, so you see that in the highlands, making up a lot of the tops of the knobs. And then uh, the slopes going away from these is made of the shale. Makoka shale, and then the uh, uh, salmon-colored uh, rock is, is Galena dolomite. So you have a lot of that, and Galena dolomite is, is where we see 
Um, most of the car's feature is also in the Solarian Dolomite, but there's no aquifers in the Solarian, so we really don't deal with that too much in this, in this talk. Next slide, please. Um, so this is Don standing next to a crevice in the Solarian Dolomite that's about a three, three feet wide. And this is, I'm inside the crevice taking a shot at it. And then the slope um, going away from it is in you know, the shale. I think this is in Route 20 going past the, uh, that fire tower that they took down that's no longer there. Next slide. And this is slurring. Don't like you see uh, sinkholes in this. Um, one of the things that I should point out at this point is if you don't have sinkholes, you still have cars features, you still have a, a car stock aquifer. So these are cover collapse sinkholes in the Solarian Dolomite, and they're about 100 feet in diameter, 30 feet deep. And, um, and this is near um, the ski resort for Chestnut Mountain or something. And uh, so I think, uh, and, and one of the things that's interesting is they form along lines. And the reason they form along lines is because they're, it's, it's soil that's fallen into crevices. And uh, so it's, so it falls in, you know, and then it, and it continues, and then works its way up from the bottom, and then you get a big collapse. And, uh, but these things are fairly stable, uh, and they're vegetated, there's grass on them. So they're, they're not really growing too much right now. Next slide. Uh, this, this is in the Galena Dolomites, um, I think around Freeport, and uh, you have these large crevices in, uh, in that. Next slide. And then um, there's, uh, there's a cave, I can't tell you where it's at, but it's along Route 20 in Galena, and uh, it's about three feet wide. It, it goes for quite a ways. Um, so that's what it looks like underground. And that's one of the one of the nice things about caves. I mean, you get in there, and, and you're actually you go down 50, 60, 100 feet deep, and, and you can see what these things look like and what the water's flowing through. Next slide. Uh, this is Don. These are, these are actually two photographs. Um, this is a sinkhole in an area with about uh, two to five feet of soil. So when you get a, when you get fairly thin soils, you get really small sinkholes in there. There are a couple of collapse sequels where the soil just falls in. And if, if you have that in a, in a, um, a crop land or a row crop area, um, you plow over that, it'll disappear very quickly. So we don't see a whole lot. And another one uh, near stream where, where there's, it's actually following a crevice. Um, so the stream is actually working its way up the crevice. And, uh, well, the stream is actually here. So. Next slide. And then we see springs, um, large springs. This is a, a circular feature where if you walk into the bottom, there's bedrock. You can see uh, really a dolomite at the bottom. And then uh, one of the sides is breached and it runs off. The water runs off into a stream. And we just um, sampled a bunch of, bunch of these springs. Uh, this year, uh, probably about 10 or 11, we plan to sample more next year and do studies and look at the water chemistry and tell a little bit more about uh, what the what the uh, contamination potential is for, for this for these uh, this karst aquifer next slide uh, this you've seen this um, I went up with um, uh, Jeff Cromer of uh, Mount Carroll uh, uh, in um, just just south of here and uh, he was He's nice enough to fly me around, and um, it's in his um, father's 1948 Vagabond, and that's that's duct tape. So we can share. We can share the seatbelt, and my heart is falling open. So at some point, I put my foot on it, and I took photographs out there. So, but it was it was fine. We didn't die. Next slide. Next slide. Done. Okay, um, more more um, more crop lines, vegetated crop lines, and and you can see that most of them are going in an east-west direction, and then there are some some uh, almost equally spaced lines going in a north-south direction, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in the next slide. Um, this is in a quarry in uh, Carroll County. Uh, and you can, you know, these, these are fractures in the quarry floor. You can see trees and vegetation growing within these. So it looks very similar to the stuff in the alfalfa. Next slide. Done. 
<laughs> and I now just covered this. This is this is a little model of um, what crop lines look like. So that's looking at a crop, a vegetated crop line head on. And um, so you get the, the soil is fairly thick, you get water seeping up into it, and uh, you get a nice uh, crop of alfalfa, but uh, you get over here where the water table is within the bedrock, um, it uh, can't get up into the soil very easily, so the, the roots of the, um, the roots of the alfalfa have to come down and get it. Uh, next slide. What's the fried egg back there? That's, that's a, um, that's the sun. <laughs> okay, uh, another thing we looked at, um, since, since you all have um, a lot of mining in this area, it, uh, we, we looked at, at mine scars because they're also following crevices that were developed 270 million years ago or earlier that were filled with, with uh, more forming solutions, you know, they, uh, they're filled with sphalerite, galena, lead, and zinc. And um, so you can use, uh, these, are, these are called dog holes, and, um, or not dog holes, what? They? what? Diggings. Anyway, um, there's another name for them. Sucker and, holes. Um, sucker holes. holes, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, sucker holes. We call them dog holes in Missouri. And um, they, um, the miners uh, would go out and they dig a hole and uh, go down to bedrock and uh, collect, the, collect the ore that was on the shallow bedrock and then go to the next, you know, and they follow the vein. So you get these line of holes. And we were out in this area uh, where there were a lot of them. It was not easy to walk. It had snowed, obviously. So, yeah, this, uh, next slide. So this, this is one of the mining areas, uh, Virginia Hill, I think. And uh, so you can see, uh, let's see, uh, I think the shaft was here, and uh, next slide. So this is a LIDAR elevation model um, that Don put together, and he overlapped uh, the mining, um, a mine map that was drawn in uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s. And you can see linear dog holes here, they actually had a shaft <coughs> um, right here. And uh, so they went underground and got the good stuff. But you can see the remnants of, of that. And then we, we use these lines to add to our uh, 18,000 uh, vegetated crop lines. Next slide. And uh, so you can see we digitize these. Uh, next slide. <coughs> So, so we're going to look at the structural geology. What, is this, what do these lines tell us about uh, structural geology of the area? You know, um, the, um, the structures of, of Illinois, the big ones, uh, there's a huge fault, the Plum River Fault Zone here, the Sandwich Fault Zone here, and the Semantic Lines. So you can see these things basically run east-west, and this is a little bit uh, northwest southeast trending. But uh, for the most part, in in Joe Davis County, we're seeing an east-west trend for most of the structures. Uh, next slide. So, by uh, by plotting the uh, the crop line data, the uh, the, su the sucker hole data, we see an east-west trend for most of the fractures in these uh, things we call rose diagrams, and then uh, a set of going north-south. But if you look across. Indiana and Illinois going up to Wisconsin, the orientation of these things changes, and um, there's, there's a reason for that. We're not sure what it is at this point, but um, it has to do with um, compressive stresses from the east. Um, so it, um, as, you go, as you go toward to Davis County, things flatten out, and then they, and they go off again uh, in a similar direction as you saw before. So, Something is unique about Joe Davis County. We're not sure what yet, other than you all. <laughs> Next slide. All right, so, so how old are these fractures? And uh, as I said, um, there are uh, the east-west trending fractures um, in the ore zones and the, the mining districts are uh, about um, 
270 million years old. Uh, they dated sphalerite um, using techniques that um, I'm not going to go into right now because I can't remember them. But that was <coughs> that was um, uh, you know before that the, the east-west fractures were here. They were dominant and um, formed during um, uh, the Mississippi and Pennsylvanian time, which is uh, about 350 million years ago to about uh, 300 million years ago. So long before the, the mineralization event. Next slide. Is that the next slide? Okay, it looks a lot like the uh, next slide. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, how do they form? Um, they form when, um, why don't you go to the next slide and I can explain this better. Okay, all right, so here's Africa. We're talking uh, <coughs> Paleozoic. We're talking Pennsylvania, Mississippi in time, about 350 million years ago. Africa is sitting up against uh, the East Coast and South America is sitting down here and everything's attached. Um, Africa was pushing against the United States, actually, came in, collided with the United, uh, the United States, or, I'm sorry, North America at that time, or Laurentia, as it was called. And um, so it collided, and when you have uh, collisions like that, the, the stresses go through the continent, all the rocks in the continent, and they, <coughs> they go parallel to the, to the collision. So when you find fractures in the rocks, you say, well, okay, um, they're associated with some sort of event where, where continents collide because that's a huge event. And then, um, so most of the uh, crevices or fractures are now oriented in an east-west, roughly east-west direction because of this collision. Uh, next slide. Okay, so where did the north-south uh, fractures come from? Well, we don't know. Um, we looked at some a lot of the, the ore deposits and their the ore deposits are trending east-west for the most part. And uh, so the north-south fractures, trending fractures had to come in sometime after the ore deposits were in place about, you know, or sometime after 270 million years ago. So um, that's, that's pretty much it. So that's, that's something that uh, somebody else has to, has to explore. It's it, we certainly uh, lay the groundwork for it, but we're not prepared to do any more research on that. Um, next slide. Okay, conclusions. Um, the, uh, the vegetated crop lines uh, basically laid bare the geology of, of northwestern Illinois with re relationship to the, uh, to the fractured crevice bedrock. And um, so we were able to map this, and the crevices uh, the fractures uh, provide the porosity for groundwater to move through and, and migrate um, all over the county. Um, because of the thin soils, uh, they're somewhere between zero and 25 feet thick. Uh, where the crop lines are located, they're somewhere between two and five feet thick. This provides uh, access of, of surface water to get into these crevices very easily, very fast, without having much um, much effect, the soils have little effect on any contaminants that might get in there. So you would expect a little bit of um, road salt, uh, septic effluent, uh, uh, nitrogen fertilizer, you know, anything getting into these, uh, into the shallow groundwater. Um, the quarries and road cuts and caves uh, provided additional information for us on that, on the, uh, the uh, looks of the, uh, uh, depth of uh, the, these crevices and, and uh, how much they are at depth. So that's one of the things we're looking at right now. We see them going down maybe 60 to 100 feet where they're open. And um, so we're, we're planning to do a little bit more work on that, see how deep these things actually go, how wide they are. Um, the crop lines, the vegetative crop lines uh, that we looked at at a new tool to uh, actually to geology because nobody's ever looked at these things seriously because they didn't last long enough to really document. And um, so they, they provide, as I said, for the basis for research. And uh, we're doing ongoing research with the help of um, 
people in your community, uh, League of Women Voters, uh, to do uh, more groundwater quality study in Wilson Springs. And thank you very much.